This um, actually arose from a completely different quarter. And I don't know if you have the pleasure of having children. I don't. But I still get children ask me questions that makes you think a lot. And the question that I was asked was, is it possible that there is a life anywhere else in the, well, not just the galaxy, but in the cosmos? Now, of course, the answer is very simple. We don't know. But it did cause me to consider the Earth in more detail and look at the features of the Earth which are essential to life. And that's basically what I'd like to present to you this evening. And to start with, I'd like to read a couple of scriptures from the Psalms. Psalm is in the Old Testament, isn't it? That's a wee joke. Sorry. <clears throat> And it's chapter 8, verse 3. And it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? Just repeat that. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you think of him? And chapter 19 the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, in speaking about it, I'd like to speak about features actually that occur on the earth which are essential to life. And then to speak about the moon, and you might be surprised that the moon has got any bearing on whether or not you can have life on this planet, but it does, and you'll see why. Also, exactly how the earth orbits around the sun has a profound impact on whether or not life can exist on this planet. And you might be surprised to hear that the other planets in the solar system also play a very key role in having life on this planet. It's of no surprise, of course, that the sun itself is one of the key elements in this. But another aspect which might be surprising is the fact of the galaxy. Exactly we, where we are in the galaxy determines whether or not life is possible on this planet. So I intend to deal with it in that order. So starting off, with, first of all, with the Earth. Now, you're very familiar, of course, that the surface of the Earth is covered by the atmosphere, and it's principally nitrogen gas. And I like this particular picture because it shows very, very nicely the, the atmosphere occurring along the bottom here. This is this very sort of haze, thin haze. It just shows you how thin the atmosphere is relative to the rest of the planet. Now, of course, the two elements which we're particularly interested in concerning life is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And we're familiar with the fact that we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. And that plants do the reverse, that they breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe in oxygen. That's in the presence of sunlight. And that there's a nice balance between the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom where the oxygen and the carbon dioxide remain at a relatively stable level because there's a, there's a nice balance of interchange between the plants and the animals. Now, of course, we're very aware of the whole business of global warming and the concept that the levels of carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere, mainly due to the activities of man. But I don't actually intend to go down that line at all. I want to try and stick to the subject at hand. Now, this is the planet Venus. And I show you this because Venus was called the sister planet of the Earth because it was of a similar size to our planet and it appeared to be of similar composition. So it was reckoned that within our solar system, if there was going to be any other planet which would have life such as we know it, Venus was the most ideal candidate. The problem with Venus was that it was covered by such a dense atmosphere that we really had no idea what was happening on the surface. And it, we've only fairly recently discovered that the surface is so hot that metal exists in its molten state. Now, it doesn't require an Einstein to work out that life cannot exist in such circumstances. And if you've ever been at the mouth of a furnace in British steel, you'll appreciate why that is the case. An interesting little aside about Venus is that the carbon dioxide levels are considerably higher than they are on this planet. And you might wonder if this is a, a runaway example of global warming. That was just a little remark, not a statement of fact. 
So we have established that Venus, although it's the most likely planet in our solar system to have life, in fact it doesn't and it is not at all possible. Now, one of the factors or you've got to think about the Earth is its size. And the reason for that is, of course, we're familiar with the concept that the mantle or the crust which we're standing on is solid. But much of the substance of our planet is molten. And we see that when we have volcanic eruptions of molten lava that spew out. Now, it is molten principally because you could think of the centre of the Earth as being like a giant nuclear reactor. And, of course, the amount of energy it's producing keeps it the, the centre a liquid. Now, you've got a problem here, and the question is, what if the planet gets smaller? Well, if the planet gets smaller, so does the nuclear reactor. And, of course, if you're familiar with the concept that the volume of an object is related to its surface area, in that the smaller the, the diameter, the bigger the surface area to the volume, and that means the bigger the loss of heat. And a small planet like Mars, which you see in this particular example, which is something like two-fifths or three-fifths of the size of this planet, has hit this problem where the core has cooled down so much that the surface temperatures are very low. And to give you an idea that you're seeing the, the north pole of the planet up here, and you'd think that was ice, but in fact it's solid methane. Methane gas is turned into solid and carbon dioxide. Now, I am a bit bemused by the statement that Mars is undergoing global warming, in that that uh, North Pole, the ice cap, is retreating. So it would appear to be that global warming is not merely a thing that is caused by man, but there seem to be other factors involved in it as well. And nobody really knows exactly what the proportion is. So that's Mars. It's too small. It's too cold well below zero degrees centigrade, and life cannot exist on it. You have the opposite problem if the planet is too big. That means that the core gets bigger, producing a lot more heat, and the surface temperature gets too high, and you've gone to the opposite extreme, where it's just too hot for life to exist on the planet. So it's rather interesting that the planet Earth is just the right size, where it's producing enough heat from its core to keep the temperature between the two critical parameters, which are 0 degrees centigrade and 100. And they are the critical parameters because that's when water exists in its liquid form. And life as we know it revolves around water. If the animal or plant is not in water, it's because water is in the animal or plant. Water is the essential feature of life as we know it. Now, next thing to move on to is to consider the moon and how it is that the moon actually has any influence upon whether or not life exists on our own planet. Now, of course, this picture here, the moon is not as close to Earth as it is in the picture. It's just that you need a much bigger screen, or shall you say a much wider screen if you were to get the two in the same picture. Now, I delight in teaching school kids occasionally and I had to teach them about tides and this is really what it's all about. And I just want to run down this line. So here we have the moon in the upper right. We have the earth down here in the lower left. And we're looking down on top of the earth. So we're actually looking, um, as it were, down onto the North Pole. And we're familiar with the concept that the earth is rotating on its axis. And it does a, a complete rotation every 24 hours. And of course, that's why we have so many hours of daylight and so many hours of dark. But this has quite a consequence on the possibility of having tides. And the reason for this is that the moon is exerting a draw on the earth in such a way that it pulls water towards it on the surface of the earth that is nearest to it. Now, I can't explain this because I don't understand. There's probably somebody in the audience that do. But the opposite is true. On the, other, the same is true on the other side, that the, the, the water level deepens. So you can actually draw a line, as it were, from the moon through the earth, and on that line, the water levels are higher. Now, if you imagine that there's a wee guy here, and of course, he wouldn't be a very wee guy if he was that size relative to the planet, but you've got to use a bit of imagination, and he's probably needing to lose some weight. This is what you call rotund. But if he's sitting here... or.